John saw these things, and they're symbolic. I realize that ref, that the book of Revelation is symbolic, but John saw things, and the things that the things symbolize, symbolize are literal. I'm telling you this over and over again. The symbols are what God or what John saw. John saw an altar. He saw horns on an altar. He saw messengers. What do those horns symbolize? What do the what does the altar symbolize? What does blood symbolize? What does what do the souls under the altar symbolize? Because the meaning of them, the seven lampstands are seven messengers, this are seven ecclesias, excuse me. And so when God, as I've told you all along, when God says what something is, his definition is definitive and it's final and we don't question it. I don't question it and you shouldn't question it either. But most people who purport to be teachers on the unveiling, they question it because it's not just not fun enough to believe what God says because then it's so much fun to interpret it and to have your own belief on it. Then everybody can be a genius in the book of Revelation. The problem with that is everybody's saying something different. But God's, for instance, the altar always means the same thing. Speaks of speaks of worship, the throne. When we see it, it's consistently representative of rule. Rain is always symbolic of the blessing of God, fire of judgment. Now, we can take these things literally and should. The rule of scriptural interpretation is literal if possible. But this whole unveiling reminding you is a vision. John's seeing a vision. So it's not actually happening as he's seeing it. But he went into the Lord's day. And it's not happening at his time. That's why these poor people like Paul and John are so confused. They're not sure if they're in a body or out of body. But John was specifically said to have been transported into the Lord's day. From that point on until late in the unveiling, when he comes back to Patmos, we are to consider these things as they're unfolding from our perspective in the future and certainly from his perspective in the future. So I'm going to try to read more of this passage without commenting and then speak to you on the horns of the altar. Let's review. And the sixth messenger trumpets, and I hear one voice. i got to stop already. One voice. <laughs> this is so contrastive to what I spoke on yesterday of how many voices or on the internet. How many voices you hear, your parents, your pastor, your friend, they all have different opinions, opinions, everybody's got opinions. This is why God inspired people to write scripture. This is why there is a written record. This, that's why we have an anchor. That is the word of God. And those who learn how to use the word of God lawfully, not unlawfully, understanding laws of language, understanding figures of speech, it is these people who God will give the greatest revelation to, and that sounds so unspiritual. Martin, how come I have to know about verbs and verbs and adjectives and the Greek language and figures of speech and these things? Is because God chose language. That's why I think writing is such a noble thing, and I try to do as much of it as I can. Writing is so noble because God sanctified it; He touched it with His own application. He wrote the Word of God. He wrote His own word and we have it and it's been miraculously preserved for us and here we have it in front of us and now what we're going to say oh that's not good enough i want another revelation what does the book of jude say uh what does this interpreter say and it's like this isn't good enough for us we want more i want to know what the conspiracy theorists have to say and so you know that's why my views i've told you this before i had like seven eight hundred views when i first started this series and then people found out that i'm not going to be sensational even though what you're about to hear from me on the sixth messenger is as sensational as can be and i want you to send these next few shows that i do on the sixth trumpet and the sixth messenger and the four messengers bound at the river euphrates and the cavalry that come forth i want you to send this far and wide because what i'm about to teach will eclipse anything that you will hear from conspiracy theorists or from those who talk about the illuminati the one world order what have you this eclipses everything because as i said truth is stranger than fiction so god gave us this word we have it and now what it's not good enough for us 
We're going to lay in our beds at night and sniff incense and smoke pot and try to get a vision of God. I want to, I want to discover Christ. You don't need to discover Christ. What is this talk about? I need to find Jesus. And you're on this personal search and God takes you through the mountains and up the hills and under the sun and you maybe smoke a little weed and you sniff incense and you drink herbal tea and God's going to give you a revelation. It's already here. Everything that God and Christ want us to know, whether it's about the unveiling or about the work of Christ, has already been recorded. As if we have plumbed the depths of this already and we need more. Yeah, Martin, I got the Word of God figured out. I got everything I need to know out of the Bible. Now I need some extra scriptural sources. Now I need to smoke a little weed and I need to drink a little green tea. I need to go to the mountains and pray. I'm going to pray for hours a day, Martin. I'm going to get into a quiet setting and meditate. You know, great. But unfortunately, it's worthless. Worthless as far as understanding God is concerned. You need to understand language and what he wrote and to be able to read it and say that's truth. For instance, 1 Timothy 4.10, God is the Savior of all humanity, especially of believers. How do you interpret that, Martin? <laughs> that's one of the most spiritual things you will ever read. And yet, I know some people who need to spiritualize that. What does God mean by that? God is the Savior of all humanity. You can go into the hills longer than Maria on the sound of music. You can twirl in a gingham dress on the top of the Alps and deliver yourself to a monastery with a mother superior who sings with a wimple so tight it squeezes her brains out and you will not come to any revelations whatsoever. You will just get self-absorbed you will become self-oriented. You will, you, will say, you will think that revelation depends on a quiet room, on a mother superior who looks like Yoda, uh, or twirling, or sitting, or smoking, or drinking. Forget about all of that. It's right here. 1 Timothy 4.10. The challenge is believing it. You want to do something stupendous for God today? You want to understand Christ? Read Colossians. It's there. Read Ephesians. It's there. Read Romans. It's already been written. Or read my series on Romans on the ZWTF newsletter, which you find at my website. I'm not inventing anything there. I'm the Henry Ford of Scripture. Henry Ford did not invent the car. It was invented by some German guy. Who? Dusseldorf? No, that's a city in Germany. I don't know who invented the car. The automobile. I don't care. Henry Ford was not an inventor. He was an innovator. He just took what existed and made sure that there was two of them in every garage. I'm trying to make sure that you have the revelation that God wants you to know in your garage. In this case, your garage is your mind and the renewing of your mind. And that doesn't happen by smoking things, by meditating, by chanting. It happens by understanding clear words. And I know some of them aren't clear. I understand that. I've complained about that myself. But God has given us tools, concordances, and we look into these. We're looking into the Word of God now. You know me. We've been analyzing words. We look at their definitions. We look at them in context, and then we simply believe them. And this is very unspiritual and very unpopular. It's unpopular, but I don't care how many listeners I have? I don't. I don't because I am working as unto the Lord and I'm working for you. If you're one person listening to me, this is for you. And it's for myself too. I'm doing this for my own edification, my own understanding, my own knowledge. Some people think you're wasting your time in the unveiling because this is not our evangel. Yet we are privileged to be living in the day when these very things are unfolding. And I said I wasn't going to comment. I'm no good at this. I am no good at this. And a voice came out of the horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth messenger who has the trumpet, loose the four messengers, one messenger dispatching four, who are bound at the great river Euphrates, which is the same river Euphrates on Google Earth, the same one in Iraq right now. That's where they are. 
and loosed were the four messengers, made ready for the hour, the day, and the month, and the year. That's where I went off the rails yesterday. I didn't go off the rails. I went on a side trail that I hope was edifying the specific time. We can do this in reverse if you want. We can go from year, month, day, hour. The hour. And this is comforting. God knows the hour, right? So they're prepared that they should be killing. Listen to this. I know it's getting rough here. And I'm not an apologist for God. I'm really, I don't. I don't apologetics, I, I, that, that term is stupid. It's a branch of uh, learning or something where you're supposed to be able to explain God and soothe people about God. Well, you know, God is really, it's almost just like apologizing for him. It's like, well, I know this sounds crazy, but I don't care how this sounds. The purpose here is to kill a third of mankind. Not every single human on the face of the earth. Again, it's limited. They're going to kill a third of mankind. That's bad enough, I know. But again, Jesus said that there will come a day. Well, Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew 20, where is it, 24? The worst time period human history has ever known. That's what we're facing here. And you and I won't be going through it, but we're facing it and we're learning about it. To kill a third of mankind. And the number of the troops of cavalry. And wait till I tell you what this cavalry is. I myself had crazy ideas when I was a Christian of what these were. I'm going to get into some of that this week. And the number of the troops of cavalry was 200 millions. I hear their number. God, that sentence sends a chill down my spine. I hear their number number. This is revelation. This is an unveiling of truth. The, un, the revelation is, is not a, a mystery. It's not a hiding of truth. It is the unveiling. And here, for the first time, a human being was taken into the future, which to us is the near future, and given a number. And this human being, John, heard the number and the number was 200 million of supernatural cavalry that are determined to be sent forth to the earth to kill a third of humanity. Not a third of the population of Israel, not a third of the population of Mesopotamia, because what's that? That's a drop in the bucket. We've done that before. We've had times like that. We've had World War I. We've had World War II. We've seen these things before, but what is going to happen here has to exceed in scope, in depth, everything that's happened before to humanity, or else this whole purpose of the unveiling to bridge the gap between not only Eon 3 and 4, but the three evil Eons and the two good Eons, it's it's a non-essential, it's a joke, it's a scaled down, it's a scale model. It's a stupid little plastic scale model if we're going to say this is limited somehow in its scope because people are just too horrified. They're too afraid of God. They're too afraid to let him speak. He is speaking here, and he is going to kill a third of humanity, and I know who he's going to kill. I know who he's going to kill this week and next, who he's going to kill, what these horsemen are, what they are for, what they do. The limited duration of their ministry, yes, it's a ministry. See it as a ministry because it comes not from the heart of Satan, but from the heart of God. 